happy, happy Tuesday. It is 12 o'clock in Cali. And I don't know where you guys, as you're jumping on or coming from, so many of my friends from the East Coast have jumped on this challenge. You guys are coming from all over. We have a lot of good friends from Peru on this, actually, Jedediah. I'll have to do a shout out um, from my just being in Peru not long ago speaking. And of course, I'll tell more about that and thank you. But this literally is a global 21 day challenge. So, hey guys, I can't believe we are in our last week. We only have a few days left on this challenge. And I hope you guys have stayed with all of the resources and, and really strategies that all of our guests have given us. As you know, we are on this challenge for 21 days to elevate our energy. And we are living in unprecedented times, as you know. But the enemy wants to take us and captivate us and cripple us with fear and discouragement and anger and resentment. But I'm telling you, those of you on this challenge, you know that we have learned how to strategically elevate our energy with the way we think, the words we use, the actions we have. And today I'm so excited to have my guest, Jedediah Thurner. Jedediah has become a dear friend of ours, my husband and I, and then also of our church here at Influence Church. And we have partnered with he and um, really the mission organization that he has such a passion for to globally go around the world. So guys, get ready. Get ready with your questions for the Q&A time at the end. And all of you that are listening right now, what I want you to hear is Jedediah's story. And he's gonna talk about how to actually elevate your energy with a global impact. You can make a difference around the world. So gosh, with that, Jedediah, welcome. Good to have you such, here, thank you. Such an honor to be with you. And obviously all of our incredible viewers from all over the world. Uh, when you shared, you know, what this was, you know, this 21 day challenge, elevate your energy, knowing the context and the climate we're living in. And obviously me being very passionate about people being able to keep their pace of passion. Yeah. I was just so honored you would consider me to be a part of it. Obviously, we love you guys so much. And I just have been excited to take the deep dive on elevate your energy and learn how myself to keep this energy up. Yeah. And obviously, you know, we've got to be really intentional right now. And um, this was not one of our questions. I sent you three, but let me just jump in with this one. Because you know that we're living in, first of all, it's an atmospheric spirit right. um, and presence of discouragement. I mean, many of us between the election and mask and COVID and fear. And, um, you know, the enemy just gave me a, 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 like a dagger to the heart the other day and he's trying to war against me and mm. never have I seen how we wrestle not against principalities or we wrestle against principalities and power powers. So they're coming at us. So you have made a global impact around the world. Tell me how you're struggling with and how you're getting victory over what the enemy meant for evil and how God's using it for good in your life. Yeah, what a great question. Mm. I think for me, probably one of the greatest battles we fight, as everyone has said, right? It's not the battle in front of us, it's the battle within us. Wow. And the six inches, the six inches of space between our ears is the battlegrounds for our life. It's the battlegrounds for our future. It's the battlegrounds for our families. It's just the fact. Mm -hmm. And I've learned what you've just identified for me. One of the keys to winning in this environment, and really I think maintaining your pace and your energy, is winning the battle for agreement. You know, what I've concluded for those watching that do have a spiritual background, that do think there's good and evil, or might even use the words God and the devil or God and the enemy, the reality is, is I'm convinced, Pastor Tammy, that, that really the enemy and God are after the same thing daily, and it's simply a battle for our agreement. In fact, if you could reduce your life every day to one massive decision, it would be winning the war of agreement. The enemy wants to agree with the pain of your past. God wants you to agree with the plan and of his promise. The enemy wants you to agree with your shame and your sin. God wants you to agree with his salvation and his saving grace. And every day we wake up, if we're to be very honest and transparent. There's a war in our mind for what we're going to agree with. Are you going to agree with what the enemy has said? Or are you going to agree with what God has said? Are you going to agree with what the news is reporting? Or are you agreeing with what God said he's going to do? And when you don't win this battle for agreements, you're actually out of alignment. You know, so for me, when I actually agree with God, I'm moving myself towards faith. When I actually agree with the enemy, I'm moving myself towards fear. So I think even in this context, conversations we should be asking ourselves is what, what are we agreeing with? Do we agree that, uh, you know, America is never going to be a great nation? Do we agree that, you know, we're going to have civil unrest forever? Do we agree that the mission of God and his mandate is not going to advance? Because at the end of the day, we can find ourselves living a, limited, a limiting life simply because we've lost a simple battle called the battle for agreement. And I've just concluded, I can't have a thought in my head that's not in God's. 
And I'm sitting there so often saying, who actually says that? It doesn't sound like God. It doesn't look like God. And if it's not God, it's probably not good. And so what am I agreeing with? And obviously you could play that out towards your identity, towards your career, um, you know, so many different things, but it's literally a battle for agreement. And that's where I'm winning every day. I'm, it's this fierce protecting space to say, this is who I'm going to agree with. And here's what I've learned. When you actually stop conversating with the devil, he stops talking. Mm. So some people are like, why is this battle so big? Because you're continuing to entertain the conversation. But the moment you go, wait, no, this is truth. This is truth. This is truth. I'm now agreeing with what God has said. You'll notice that that voice stops coming because it doesn't have anyone participating in the conversation with it. But so many of us, we entertain these thoughts for hours, for hours about our spouse, about our life, about our future, about our careers. We entertain these thoughts for everything. And we wonder why the devil's winning is because we're willing to engage in a conversation that's not true. Okay, now we have to stop right here a second because this is so good. And everyone knows on this challenge, Jedediah, that they are encouraged to take notes. It's pen in hand and paper because you're not going to remember. You're going to give me emojis. I'm seeing all you guys doing this. Good, good, good. But if you don't write it, you won't practice it. That's good. So right now, make sure you write down. Um, it is it, you got to win the battle um, with agreement. Who are you agreeing with? Write down, and even in your mind right now, oh my gosh, I have been agreeing with the fact that I'm a failure. I'll never get a job. I've gained 20 pounds on COVID. My wife's having an affair. My all the lies of the enemy, and you're playing that over and over. You've you've entered into the battle with agreement with the enemy because That's there's right. just really there's there's a war out there and you get to decide whose side you're on that was perfect and then write that down and then also i love what you just said um stop having a conversation with the enemy stop having a conversation and you said when you do then you'll stop he'll stop talking that's right he'll stop talking that's, that's, right. that's so good guys and put that in your own life these practical tools how to literally start hearing from god and stop hearing from the enemy so that was brilliant and i and i would add tammy i mean just to add some scriptural context to us this is the power of an amen right yeah. the bible has said you know mm -hmm. all of god's promises are yes in christ jesus mm -hmm. and with our amen so okay. what's amazing is that verse says everything god's promised us he's already said yes to. here's the good news for everyone watching every promise god's committed to you your family your children your children's children mm -hmm. he's not pondering he's not posturing he's not wondering he's not hoping you'll do something worthy of him mm -hmm. being good and now being gracious mm -hmm. so every promise he's already said yes to but the contingency it says and with our amen which is and with our agreement which means god's promises are never looking for our assessment they're simply looking for agreement. And one of the one of the ways that I've trained myself is I want to be the easiest amen in every room. So when truth is being released on this Elevate Your Energy Challenge, when truth is being released, we could sit back and say, how does that apply to me? Or does that really work? And we begin to assess it. But God's promises are never looking for an assessment. They're just simply looking for an agreement. And that's the power of an amen to agreeing with what God has said. Yeah. And we wow. got one amen from Karen Goodswell. I'm so yeah, pumped. So amen. good. So good. So it's not an assessment. It's an agreement. And that is right. so powerful. That's so powerful. Well, our time obviously is going to go so quickly. So I want to jump in a little bit about how, first of all, we met right. and the privilege we had to serve with you in Peru. But tell us a little bit about this global impact and um, missions.me, what you guys do and how you got involved with that, Jedediah. Yeah. So, you know, so I was a missionary's kid. I lived in a hundred homes before I was 25 years old. Um, that's not a lie. I lived in every, every Hawaiian island, but Kauai, every city in Maui, but Hana, Tahiti, New Zealand, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Miami, California. We're not feeling real sorry for you now. Though, <laughs> know, now. Come on. My parents were very selective on where God can take <laughs> If it's sunny and beaches, yes, Lord, we'll serve at your, at I love your it. will. And, um, and to be honest, by the time I got to college, I, you know, I had such I had hurt from ministry. You know, at the end of the day, when you love broken people, they're going to break things, you know? And so just uh -huh. that journey of Say what it again. was. But Say that again. Say when that you again. love broken people, they're going to break things, you know? And so mm. we've, my parents had, had this outrageous love for people, marginalized, oppressed, broken, which means those people also had the propensity to continue to break and to hurt and to do damage. And in seeing that, and of course, obviously, I think even the constructs of the negative aspects of religion and church, created a person who by the time I got to college, I said, I will never be doing ministry. In fact, when I met my wife, she looked at me and said, I'll never marry a pastor, a preacher, missionary, evangelist. And I said, sign me up. My exact words, Tammy, were let's just be rich and write large mm -hmm. tithe checks. Like I just got to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, what I'm doing now, to be honest, mm -hmm. is our nightmare. This is everything we said we'd never do, but I can go on record and say what I thought was going to be a nightmare has become better than any dream I could have ever had 
any script I could have written, any narrative I could have crafted. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact. And mm -hmm. really the journey to get to this point, to be honest, was simple steps of agreement. It was simple yeses. So a lot of people are like, how'd you get to this point where you met with presidents and mobilized thousands of missionaries and you've seen sustainable transformation? I was like, it started off by saying yes to serving in the nursery. It started off by saying yes to lead a small group. And, and obviously when I, when I came in contact with Dominic Russo and the missions.me team is really 2011. And I stepped into this context and said, man, I've never seen missions done with excellence. You know, and I remember that was one of the first things that attracted me. I said, wait a second, this is excellent. From the hotels we're staying into, the strategy of the week, to the significance of people we're working with. And really, I, was, I fell in love with this thought that excellence is our evangelism. And that's why it's so significant for people that have to maintain energy, because without energy, you can't be excellent. And excellence actually is a manifestation of divine wisdom. So it actually testifies of who God is. Mm. And I fell in love with the excellence of the org and then found out about the vision and strategy. And I think for me, there's a lot of people that have said, let's change the world or let's bring revival or let's see citywide transformation. But when you say how, most people don't have a plan. <laughs> you know, most people is like, we're just gonna keep saying it's gonna happen and it's gonna happen. And this was the first group of people that had a strategy and a plan. Um, and we would say strategies are diligence, not our dependence. So I want to be very clear. It wasn't that strategy made it successful. Strategy is us stewarding the natural, what God's revealed to us in the supernatural. Mm. But our dependence is still on the supernatural. Mm. But without strategy, you go, man, the supernatural is going to be limited because it doesn't have a vehicle for it to thrive in. Good. And so I, I, I saw what they're doing. And obviously this, this outrageous dream of laying nations at the feet of Jesus, the mandate for every single believer is to go and not disciple just people, but nations, cultures, people groups, and fell in love with it and said, this is what I was born for, you know, mm -hmm. and we sold houses and businesses and surrendered our lives to this thing. Mm -hmm. And now we've had the you know, ability to be in four nations, four one nation, one days. We've seen just some quick stats. I think over 700, 30,000 people have gotten some form of humanitarian relief, whether that was a new home, new shoes, mm -hmm. uh, medical brigades. We've given 96,000 people medical treatment. Yeah. We've equipped 92,000 pastors and leaders. You've helped with that. We've reached 3.6, and I say we, you, everyone watching, 3.6 million people face-to-face -face with a gospel presentation, 1.1 of them being, 1.1 million of them being high school students in public high schools. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously this is a, a really average snapshot of all that takes place. Yeah. But I yeah. just figured if we're going to live this mist in this vapor, man, it might as well have as much impact on eternity as possible. Yeah. And that's kind of how I got stuck doing what I'm doing. Well, you know, and the reason I wanted you on this challenge is, you know, I've had a variety of different thought leaders. And the thing I love about you in the ministry is obviously you're, the energy is there. It's so evident. But you just said something, everybody, that I want you to write down. It's a combination of strategy and supernatural. That's great. So you have strategy and supernatural. So think about your life right now. These two elements have to come together. God wants you to have strategy. He tells us many are the plans of man. He wants us to make plans, but That's he right. directs our paths. That's he right. breathes on it. He supernaturally comes in and directs us. And what I love about working with um, missions.me is it was beautiful how you went in and you met with Peru or Honduras or other countries and you met with the president. So it was definitely top down, but listen to me, everybody, they had strategy and you've got to be smart with strategy because they went in as humanitarian relief. What right. president is not going to receive humanitarian relief for their country? Who's not going to receive humanitarian relief from the United States of America and thousands of people that are going to come in. So you have to realize you have to be smart enough to have a strategy that sells. Then you get on your face before God and you ask for that supernatural anointing because the favor that you guys had when you sat down with these presidents and they opened up their country, they opened up their resources, their stadiums. So let's take us to that experience you had. Personally, I went to Peru. So when you sat down with the president of Peru and you used your strategy of humanitarian resources, which we were part of, but then they allowed you to come in and share which what we believe is life giving and that's the gospel of Christ. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you I think you just said it so well. And the way I would frame it again, strategy is our diligence, um, but it's not our dependence. You know, so for everyone listening, it's our diligence, but it's not our dependence. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you, if you're building a strategy for something that doesn't require God, you'll never get to the point where you need God. You know, mm -hmm. so we've we've obviously picked a vehicle that says we're going to run out of relationships, of resources, of revelation, which means God's going to have to run in. 
But if you create a vision that doesn't require the impossible, then God's never going to get involved. And you can actually just live in the security of strategy because you mm -hmm. actually will never need the necessity of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about every meeting we've had with a government leader, so many people have said, how'd you get the first meeting? I mean, when you're kids in your 20s and sat with the president of Honduras and then, you know, multiple presidents. One thing I've realized, Tammy, is that sometimes you have favor because you're the only one that has faith. Wow. Sometimes you're the one that has faith because you're the only one that has faith. A great example of this would be David. David's a teenage boy. He's bringing some cheese and crackers to his brothers. He's not a warrior. He's not even supposed to be at the battlefield. He literally shows up as a just a normal day following his dad's orders. And suddenly within, I don't know what that dialogue could have been. Let's just be generous. Within two hours, he finds himself in the most sacred conversation as a kid before the king talking about how he's going to fight a giant. And people go, how did David get in the room? Because there was fighting men who had no faith, so they had no faith. And what I've realized is that when you step out in faith, it actually creates a wake of favor that follows you. So we walked into nations that people said, this nation's done, it's insolvent, the government could have been bankrupt, it's murder capital of the world, we just had a political overthrow. And the leaders of that nation, in many cases, were like, I mean, I think of America, this is it, we'll never have hope, this is over. But the reality is, is favor does not follow fear and favor does not follow hopelessness. Favor follows faith. And right now, the most important thing we could do is stand up in faith. And in whatever sphere you're in, faith in your job, faith in your home, faith in a conversation, faith in your neighborhood. And when you actually step out in faith, you realize that God's going to follow up your steps of faith with acts of favor. And that's how we got in, in so, these awesome. kings is okay. because we actually thought we we're supposed to be in the conversation. Yeah. Yep. You know? Okay. And that's so good. Listen, write this down. Sometimes you're the only one with, uh, sometimes you're the only one with favor because you're the only one with faith. That's right. And I think somebody needs to hear that right now because you say, God, where's your favor? Where's your favor? And God says, where's your faith? That's Walk so out in faith. Now we're going to move in a little bit here because I want to kind of get to know some personal side here. And we all Great. ask this question because you're high energy. You are literally, we know things have changed a little bit right now because of, um, you know, closing down our countries and so many things right. with the pandemic, but you have a beautiful wife and you I have do. five beautiful children, four, four, four. four. Don't okay. prophesy. Don't put, no, I'm four. not going to prophesy four. that. One. Okay. Four. But you have beautiful children. So how do you manage because you have this incredible ministry, incredible family, and you are speaking and you're, so talk to us a little bit. Um, how do you manage your life without right. things like burnout or frustration or marital issues or all those kinds of, talk to us about a little bit of personal management. I will. Yeah. I think when it comes to family, you know, I get asked this question all the time. You know, you know, I'd say until COVID we traveled a couple hundred thousand miles a year. Um, I wouldn't want to tell you how many days gone I was, but it was mm -hmm. severe. I just don't say it publicly because it looks abusive. It's like, what's wrong? But it's all with agreement. You know, it's all with my wife's agreement. But people always say, how do you do your kids? And I go intentionally. Yeah. I, I actually always tell people the moment I've stopped thinking about it is the moment my family is going to be in trouble. So mm -hmm. every trip, every withdrawal mm -hmm. is actually managed, you know, through am I being intentional with my family? And what I've just committed to is I'm not going to give my family what's left. I'm going to give my family what's best. And so mm -hmm. often in the world of business and ministry, we actually give our family what's left because we're building a business or because it's a great cause or it's a great charity. And then we come back and we're exhausted and we literally, we literally give our family what's left and not what's best. And I just concluded early on, I've seen the abuse of family and ministry. And I just said, I'm not going to give the world what I don't give my family. So I have to give the world tons of my time. I'm going to give my family more. If I give the world my money, we're very generous as individuals. I'm not going to budget my wife so I can bless others. I have a God that's got enough to bless my wife and to bless others. Uh, so that is a big part of it. And I think one of the greatest for any parent out there, the thing that I, I learned, and it was actually Pastor Bill Johnson who shared this with me. I'd like to take credit for it, but it's not. I'll never forget sitting and saying, hey, you've done these ministries and your kids. I love them all. How have you done it? And he's said these words he goes you need to understand something Jed he said your kids are going to pay two prices they're going to pay a price for the call of God on your life mm. and they're going to pay a price for the call of God on their life mm. the price they pay for the call of God on their life God rewards wow. the price they pay for the call of God on your life you have to reward that's good I'll never forget it that's he good. said you actually have to reward them for the price they're paying for your call because your reward is obviously the benefit of obeying God. But their reward so is good. not, there's not a reward. It's in legacy, but not in the moment. 
And so I started taking every trip, every withdrawal through how I'm going to reward my kids. Are we going to Disneyland? Am I coming back with gifts? Like there's not mm -hmm. one trip I take that mm -hmm. I don't reconcile with a reward, whether it's quality yes. time. So, so significant. Um, and then for me, I'm just so big on, you know, show me your schedule and I'll show you your values. You know, so there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that say, you know, I really care about a date night, but they don't have one date scheduled. I really care about right. my family, but they don't have one family vacation scheduled. And so right. for us, first and foremost, we started scheduling our family first, then ministry. Because if you show okay. me your schedules, I'll tell you your values. And if your schedule is so booked 10 hours a day on calls for your business, and you're yeah. married with kids, you've determined by your schedule, your value is your business over your family. Yeah, and so for me, I just look at my schedule and that's going to tell you if I care about my family. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, this was really neat. You know, our son, Josh, and he made a comment. I interviewed him as well. And he's been so successful with so many businesses. And I asked him about life balance. And if you guys missed that one, I just want to reiterate because I thought it was so good. He said, mom, life balance doesn't exist. Right. He said, I like to call it life integration. He said, because I'm intentional about integrating my family into my life. And as we've shifted, and so many of us are staying at home and we're working at home, they have a home up in Idaho. So they've been able to literally, he said, it may be 10 o'clock and I'm in the middle of a call and I'm like, dude, give me five minutes. Let's go play some one-on-one -on -one ball. You know, I'm going to take this. Hey, I'm running to Idaho. I'm going to take my son with me where he didn't used to be able to do that, a nine to five kind of cubicle kind of a job. And I think we're shifting, we're pivoting with so many stay at home um, families right now and work right. from home. So guys, I'm just telling you, be right. intentional about how you do life. What Jedediah just said, show me your schedule and I'll determine your priorities. You know, I tell, I love to tell people this all the time, Jedediah, show me your phone and who you follow on your podcast, yeah, on your audible it. books, on your, th then I'm going to know who your mentors are. Exactly. You know? So you so can good. tell a lot about a person by who they follow and what they do. And I just think I love that idea of life integration and just, and I think you, and I don't mean to interrupt him. I think you, with what you guys are doing, you've nailed it for me, as I think, as we've continued to grow as leaders, you know, we're on this never ending journey of not arriving. That's where yeah. we're at. Yeah. It's probably a year ago. I mean, just imagine all the years we've done it a year ago is where I started managing my energy over my time. Mm -hmm. So I am literally, all of my life is energy management. It's not time management. Mm -hmm. We could go three hours today and yeah. I would leave this conversation filled up, fueled, focused, excited. This did not take my energy away. It gave me more energy, but I yeah. could do a five minute call with the wrong person Good. and I've lost five hours of energy. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, is because we want to be accessible and available to people. We think we have to say yes to everyone. Yeah. I have seasons. I'm just going to be honest. There's people in my life. Some could be blood. I don't want to say, but some could be blood. Mm -hmm. There's times when I go, this conversation's a black hole that re removes energy. And I love you so much, but I'm protecting energy because of my cause and my mm -hmm. calling. Yes. And you have to sit there at times and say, hey, yeah, you're in trouble, but you're probably going to heaven. All these other people aren't. And yeah. I got to protect energy. And I think yep. that is so, people don't know this. They're just like, well, I had to take the call. I had to take the call. I have people that are exhausted. You know what's managing energy? Turning off the news for some people. Yeah, absolutely. Turning off social media. And you yes. sit there, you go, I did. I woke up and I read the news. My whole day's jacked. Yeah, absolutely. cut that out. Absolutely. Protect your energy, absolutely. not your time. You could give people absolutely. endless time who give you energy, but you have to give mm -hmm. people little or no time who reduce your energy. So good, so good. Okay, we're at that point now where we're excited to hear those three coaching takeaways that you would have. You said so many things we could actually be done right now, but what would be those three things that you would want to encourage us, just three coaching takeaways? And my notes are just about full here. Well, you snagged some of them from our conversation since you jumped ahead, but we're gonna, we're gonna give you some great ones. I okay. think for me, first and foremost, is no one gets to a desired destination by default. Okay. No one gets to a desired destination by default. It's always by design. And at the end of the day, you could be living, living and leading by default or living and leading by design. What you've just created is you've created 21 days of design. And obviously, I believe you're going to give people opportunities to continue to take a journey with you. Mm -hmm. And what I've just learned, no one ends up in Hawaii on a vacation with millions in the bank and has lost 30 pounds by default. You don't say, how'd you get here? I stumbled onto the plane. I got millions in the bank and I lost weight. No, it was all by design. Most so people true. are living and leading their lives by default. And when you think about elevating your energy, that will never happen by default. Your body, your mind, and your spirit will never move towards energy creation. It'll always move to energy you know, reduction mm -hmm. by default. If I go to default, I lose energy. If I go to design, 
So you have to ask yourself all the time, am I living by default or if I'm living by design? Oh. And every day we can take control of our life by designing our day, by mm -hmm. designing our week. Mm -hmm. But most people are just going through emotion and they're That's living it. by default. That's as, it. You, as you become a leader who lives by design and not by default, one of the ways I constantly stay in that position is there's questions I ask myself. So I always say questions leaders should ask themselves every day. <laughs> you know, like these are the things that I make sure I'm not just moving towards autopilot. And one of them, which I think is so significantly connected to energy, is are you competing and comparing with people around you? A better way to ask that to leaders out there is are you looking around or are you looking ahead? Because what I've realized is that comparison is the enemy of gratefulness. It's the enemy of gratefulness. So if you think about a grateful spirit, you have energy. When you're grateful, you're happy, you have joy, you have passion, you have enthusiasm. And I, I, would, I would explain it this way. I have four kids now. I'll never forget a few Christmases ago, I got a Naya present. I spent so much time thinking about the giver. She opened it, she loved it. This is my nine-year-old daughter. She was seven at the time. She's like, this is amazing. And then I got my son, his gift. Gift for a four-year-old boy, like perfect. When he opened his gift, Anaya started saying, why didn't I get this gift? I'll just never forget it. Why didn't I get this gift? And here's what I learned in that moment. First of all, I was sitting there going, I got you this gift. I thought of you, I cared for you. When you begin to compare, you actually begin to devalue the gift and devalue the gift giver. I want people to hear this. When you actually begin to compare, why do they have that job? Why did they have that church? Why did they have that favor? Why did they have that access? Why is their Instagram taking off and mine not? Why is their book selling more than me? When you begin to compare, you literally begin to devalue what God's given you. So instead of focused on what's in front of you and what's ahead of you, you're focused on what's around you. You literally go, God, this spouse you gave me sucks. This church, horrible. This, you literally begin to devalue the gift, but not even that, you begin to devalue the gift giver. You literally begin to say, God, you didn't think about me enough. God, you didn't care enough. And I'll never forget, just to make, I'm going to hammer this point because I, I know we got a few minutes. I moved to Michigan. When we moved to Michigan to help build this org and transition an existing church, which was in debt, uh, extremely in debt, very small church. It was a micro church with a mega church building and budget. I mean, it was just dry. And I remember all my friends were in more attractive places than Michigan, had more successful works. And I remember one day sitting there being like, God, why did you bring me here? I don't like winter. Jack Frost can go home. This is horrible. And I'll never forget him saying, I'm not going to judge you based on what I gave that person. I'm going to judge you based on what I gave you. Yeah. The parable of the talents, right, is I'm going to judge each one, not by what I gave someone else, but what I placed in your hand. So at the end of your life, God's going to say, what did I do? What did you do with what I gave you? Not what did you do with what I gave someone else? And the reality is, is you can never steward and enjoy what God's given you when you're constantly comparing and competing with what God's given someone else. And I would just encourage you, you're only competing for the grace in your race. No matter what business you're in, no matter what industry you're in, there's no competition in the kingdom. God's given us a very specific grace and a very specific race. And we're not mm -hmm. running against each other. We're running against ourselves. That's yeah. it. And you'll never be able to finish your race well if you're constantly looking. Or, I mean, this is what most leaders are doing right now. They're looking, what are they doing? How are they leading? And literally people aren't getting connected with God to actually, actually make a difference. And I would say in the context of energy, so this was not on my original three talking points. So the first was don't live by default, live by design. The second was is the comparison is the enemy of gratefulness. It devalues the gift and devalues the gift giver. And I would say in this context right now with the outrageous spirit of divisiveness and disunity that's being sold into our soil, I think a question that I ask myself constantly is who do I need to forgive? Mm -hmm. Who do I need to forgive or who do I need to ask forgiveness for? I can tell you personally, one of the things that literally is an endless drain on energy is unforgiveness. Yeah. Any, that's an endless drain is, is literally just not being right with people. And I'm telling you, sometimes there's people, I have a few people in my life, I forgave five years in a row for something they did 15 years ago. <laughs> and it was like, I constantly was like, I'm not done yet. There's, and I'll tell you, I'm at this stage in my life. I don't have anyone I need to forgive. Like it's finally at this point where it's like, mm -hmm. and so I just want everyone out there as you're moving mm -hmm. forward at the end of the day, you need to decide who do I need to forgive or mm -hmm. who do I need to ask forgiveness for? Because you never can truly elevate your energy to the capacity it has 
when you're hanging under the weight of unforgiveness, bitterness, and hurt. The key to endless energy is not entitlement, it's empowerment, which means it starts with taking ownership for who you are and where you are and what's been done. It's removing a victim mentality and saying, Mm -hmm. no, I'm going to determine my future regardless Mm -hmm. of my past. And I think those would be my three takeaways for those watching. Okay, first of all, can we just go into the chat, everybody, and say thank you, Jedediah. Um, you were our Jed for short. Um, thank you, and honestly, there was so much. I'm gonna actually go back and actually have this transcribed Come because on. you had so many great things you said, and um, I, my mind's just rushing right now with so many things that I have to go back, even in my own life, and reevaluate. And so I want to thank you for your time, your expertise, everybody. I really want you to check out missions.me. Um, I know we're out of time, but in just like 30 seconds, can you tell us about what you guys? are doing with LA in case anybody wants to be involved with that I know that's coming up maybe next year yeah yeah no love has the limit started this July we were committed to changing the headlines in Los Angeles for the next 12 months putting on the greatest display of outrageous love the city's ever experienced Mm -hmm. marching into the communication capital of the world Mm -hmm. in the midst of unrest in the midst of hate in the midst of political tensions and literally putting on a display of the only thing that can change our lives which is God's love And we're going to be focusing on foster care and transitional housing for homelessness. And we also are going to put a hope community in all 35 state prisons in California. And everyone can come next year and be a part of the team, which is uh, the end of July. Go look at lovehasolimits.com or One Day LA. You can find all of it. Yeah. And you know, it's so beautiful how God actually started preparing your hearts for that before the greatest need LA's ever had. And uh, come next year, when we're ready to really get in, boots on the ground, it's going to be time. So we're going to be there with you. We love and appreciate you guys. Hey, guys, our time is up. I'm so excited about tomorrow. Don't miss our time. I have Holly Wagner. And you know Holly. She's an amazing woman of God, also in L.A. Um, What a story. You don't want to miss that. 12 o'clock. And for those of you who are on our Zoom link, we're going to be on our Q&A time with Jedediah right now. I also, don't jump off yet. Remember, if you want to be a part of the Stuck to Unstoppable eight-week coaching session. It's going to be right there in the chat. Rachel's putting it in now. It's going to be eight weeks of personal life coaching with me, and it's going to be an incredible time. Uh, One of our topics is actually resentment and entitlement. So we're going to be touching on that, Jedediah. You don't want to miss this coaching time together. Love you guys so much. I look forward to seeing you at noon, same place. Love you, Jed. We'll see you just another second back on the Zoom link. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.